So what we need is we need an all sector wedges approach to carbon emissions. So here we've got a wedge for efficiency. So what we need to do is we've constantly in the West say been growing our energy use each year. It grows consistently at a moderate rate and once that compounds year on year it ends up to being a really big deal after 10 or 20 years. What we can do is we can actually flatline that growth by uh, finding a saving each year, for finding a number of savings for any new uses of energy we have. So that's been demonstrated as something that's occurred really successfully in, in California in the past. We need a wedge for wind. Obviously we need to look at 30% to 50% wind power in Australia. We've got some of the world's best wind resource. Um, our geography means that we're very large and distributed so we can rely on wind power when you spread it out over our, our, our large vast country. Solar thermal with storage is commercially available now. So transport, electrification is the predominant fix there. So moving away from combusting fuels, from exploring for them, extracting them, distributing them around the world, refining them and then distributing them to your petrol station, into your fuel tank, then having 70% of it go up the, out the exhaust and out the motor as heat. We move beyond that and we actually use renewables to power our transportation. And that's predominantly rail and some electric vehicles and plug-in hybrid electric vehicles. I'll tell you about them. Um, agricultural sector needs to be uh, restructured. Avoided deforestation. So this is grabbing our na native forests, drawing a line around them and saying um, they're significant carbon stores. What we need to do then is the next wedge is reforest around the periphery and we can do selective logging throughout the reforestation. So actually creating a buffer around the periphery of existing native forests uh, where you can also do some uh, activity for resources. And then finally we've got agrichar and agrichar is uh, a method of, of actually grabbing our crop wastes and our algae for, uh, that we can grow at sewage farms and then, uh, and then cooking that up in the absence of oxygen and putting that char, which has got no sort of energy value, into soils and it allows uh, water retention and, uh, and, and increases crop yields, but also that, that carbon is locked down there for thousands of years and that's been demonstrated by people in the Amazon. We've got uh, our solar energy, we've got our electrification of transportation, uh, we've got our wind power and we've got our, we've got our uh, energy efficiency and you bring all this together and we get our, our solutions to climate change. So we've heard about clean coal and we need to address that. So we can invent a coal solution. And there's a new one every week. You know, you only have to listen to the marketing departments of the coal companies. And this is the latest one here. You know, they've got their uh, scrubbing brushes out and their uh, high pressure water hose and they're going to clean that coal up. And uh, you know, I'm sure they could get a grant if they asked for it. And uh, all we've got concrete, steel and glass. And that's what solar thermal with storage is. It's concrete, steel and glass. We've got a simple system of mirrors that reflect light up onto a tube. The tube carries water. The water goes through a turbine. It spins around. It causes a generator to spin around and out comes electricity, which you plug into your electricity grid. And to take it further, you don't only get your electricity when the sun's shining, but we've got storage so we can dispatch the power at night and meet all of our electricity needs. So here's a whole lot of solar thermal technologies you can have a look at. We've got troughs and power towers and dishes. And we've got these compact linear Fresnel systems which are invented here at University of Sydney. So if you want to know about solar thermal, you've got to go back to 1912. So sort of you know, similar age to the motor vehicle. We've got, um, got a guy, Frank Schumann, from the United States and he went to the Reichstag in, Germ in Germany and he got a grant to build a solar thermal field to pump water they pumped water to irrigate uh, cotton fields south of Egypt and they used giant troughs and the troughs reflected light on the pipe like I spoke about before and that drove the pump and pumped the water 22,000 litres per minute. Unfortunately World War One came along and uh, Frank Schumann raced back to the United States in, uh, to safety and the plant was bombed and destroyed and uh, that was the end of that and unfortunately they found oil in uh, the region and decided Oh, that was an easy way to generate the power to pump the water and, uh, and oil replaced that uh, sunny solar start we had in 1912. Okay, so here we've got a big solar plant in the Mojave Desert in California. It's been operating for 20 years. It's proven the technology, glass, concrete, steel, um, that they produce steam and drive turbines. They've actually repeated it again recently to, to incorporate a whole lot of new developments. So still the stock standard 
solid trough plant, the 1912 design, uh, but they've streamlined a few things, automated the manufacturing, and this is called Nevada Solar One. It was built by Axiona, which is a company that operates in the wind, in, in wind industry in, in Australia. Uh, they're not doing any solar thermal plants here, but uh, they've uh, proven the design again by building this plant in Nevada. And the great thing about the initial plants you build, build with solar thermal is they match towards that really expensive daily summer de demand, and they'll dispatch the, 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 the full amount of power that they uh, are designed to during that period. So it really makes the initial integration of them uh, not as expensive as it would be uh, if you were integrating some other kind of technology. So here's what the Spaniards are doing. This is a Spanish solar power tower. This is built by a company called Abengoa, and uh, they use giant mirrors the size, of, uh, the size of tennis courts. And here you can see a little man down there on the left-hand picture at the bottom. And uh, these mirrors, they're called heliostat mirrors, they reflect light up onto the top of the tower where there's a giant boiler, it's called a receiver, and uh, that superheated steam then drives a turbine. Um, here you can see a diagram of it. There's all the mirrors pointing up at the top of the tower. Uh, then you've got the steam storage system, so it can dispatch powers, power if clouds come over or if it's after dark. And, uh, and you've got a diagram down here of the mirrors reflecting onto the central receiving tower. A few more photos, if you're up the top of the tower and you look down, that's what the mirror field looks like and all the light is shining up on the absorber. And here is the, the two power towers, the one that we're looking at in the foreground and the new one that's about to go online in the next few weeks in the background. And uh, the, these plants can run uh, around the clock with storage. Here we've actually got a, a company called eSolar from the United States and Google's backing them because Google has a plan as a huge energy user in the United States to power all its data centers with renewable energy. So they've backed eSolar with some of their philanthropy and, uh, and they're, they're hoping to get that company um, uh, up and commercial early and, uh, and produce solar energy so they can do that. So that's another approach. Here they use uh, mirrors that are one meter by one meter instead of the big tennis court size mirrors. They can pack a lot more mirrors on the same amount of land. So what it means is that um, because the overshadowing between the mirrors is, is less, uh, they can effectively have a denser solar field than, than, the, than the Spanish approach. So if you're somewhere that's landlocked, unlike Australia where the approach doesn't really matter because we've got enough land for any of the, for any of the approaches, then the e-solar approach is, is a pretty good one because it's compact and uh, is quite space conscious. And here we've got a plant that's just been built in Spain called Andesol. And Andesol's really interesting because it includes a much bigger mirror field and a, and a salt storage setup that can store 7.5 hours of the plant's output. So when the sun goes down, the plant keeps producing for 7.5 hours. Um, that's really considerable because effectively that means that, that less, lesser nighttime power use that you still need to cater for can be catered for from solar thermal plants. And here's, here's a bit of how they work. These are the troughs again, same as the, uh, same as the troughs from the, the plant in Egypt. And the light hits the trough and bounces onto the reflector. Um, there's a picture up there of the trough. And uh, here's, your, here's your plants in the foreground. We've got Andesol 1, which has already been built. Andesol 2, which is almost uh, finished completion as well. And Andesol 3, which will, uh, which will be completed in 2013. And here's what's really interesting are these solar salt storage tanks. So we'll have a closer look at those. So here's the storage tanks up close. Um, this is before they've laid some of the mirrors down. These are giant tanks and they hold a combination of potassium nitrate and sodium nitrate. And uh, they're, they're molten. And whenever they want to put heat in there, they just run the heat through, it gets absorbed there. And then after dark, they can draw the heat down again and drive the turbines. There's an overhead of the tanks. And here's inside the tank. This is the giant tank. It's 38 metres diameter and 14 metres high, which is pretty amazing because that multi-hectare field of solar mirrors, 7.5 hours of its output can be stored in just two tanks that are 14 metres high by 38 metres diameter. And you see the, the, the uh, workmen in the middle there as they're constructing the tank. And here's a mirror going into place, one of the final mirrors at uh, what was the world's biggest solar power plant under construction in Spain.